Hey y'all, welcome back to Everything MTG. My name is Justin, and today we're going to be covering day four of our Commander 2018 spoilers. Uh, as I see that I'm going through the spoiler list now, there are some still coming down the pipe, even at the time that I'm posting this. So if some uh, might be left over from today, I will cover them tomorrow. It seems like today they're focusing on the Esper deck, which is pretty great. Uh, I've looked through these spoilers and I'm pretty excited for some of these. So we'll go ahead and get started. We have Isolated Watchtower which is a land, you can tap and add wastes, or you can pay two to tap and scry one, then you may reveal the top card of your library. If a basic land card is revealed this way, put it onto the battlefield tapped. Activate this ability only if an opponent controls at least two more lands than you. Pretty good. I mean, it's, it's kind of specific that your opponent has to control at least two or more lands, but that's such a good effect that you can uh, really, I mean, top card matters. You can get an extra land on the field if you're behind. I like it. Next card we're looking at is Genesis Storm, 4 and double green for a sorcery. When you cast this spell, copy it for each time you've cast your commander from the command zone this game. Reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a non-land permanent card. You may put that card onto the battlefield. Then put all cards revealed this way that weren't put onto the battlefield on the bottom of your library in a random order. Mm. We've seen similar cards to this, especially the ones that rely on copying it from your commander. Powerful effects, expensive cost, but very good. Um, like I've said about some of the other ones, it can definitely be a game ender. Pumping out, you know, three or maybe even four non-land permanents off the top of your deck can be really crazy, especially if you're playing a top deck matters kind of deal. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Allergies killing me. So that can be really good. We'll get on to our next card here. It's called Portent. It is one blue for a sorcery. Look at the top three cards of target player's library. Target player's library, not your own. Or it could be your own. Then put them back in any order. You may have that player shuffle their library. Draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. I am unbelievably excited about this card. It's unfortunate that's in sorcery, but I would absolutely play this in uh, some of the decks that I'm playing now, some of the controly decks. It's such a good effect for one blue. You can basically fate seal your opponent top three, put them back in any order, and then if you don't like what's on top, either be it yours or theirs, you can make them shuffle it away, and then you get to draw a card on top of it. So it's a one blue, scry three, draw one, essentially. Um, it's not quite that good, but it is pretty good. Uh, the next card we are looking at is probably my favorite from all the ones that they've uh, spoiled for the Esper deck so far. It's one of the side commanders, I believe. It's Yoriko, the Tiger's Shadow. It's one colorless, a blue, and a black for a 1-3 legendary human ninja. It has Commander Ninjutsu for blue and a black. So you pay blue and a black, return an unblocked attacker you control to hand. Put this card onto the battlefield from your hand or the command zone, tapped and attacking. And it has whenever a ninja you control deals combat damage to a player, reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. Each opponent loses life equal to that card's converted mana cost. This card is absolutely amazing. It's so exciting, for me anyways, it's in my favorite colors, blue and black. It's only a 3 cost, and yes, it's a 1-3. It's only a 3 cost, but that Commander Ninjutsu is absolutely crazy for allowing you to get around Commander cost. It's beyond nuts. If you manage to do this with a little bit of nin Ninja Synergy, uh, you can be revealing cards off the top of your library, making people take extra damage off their CMC. It can be utterly insane. I mean, at any point in time, your opponent is going to have to be worried about not blocking something. Even a silly little 1-1, one -one, you could easily bring Yoriko in. And yes, she would still only hit for one, but then they might be getting hit for four or five additional damage off the top deck from her ability. So it's just a, a wonderful pressure card. I really love this card. Um, it, it might sway me towards picking up the Esper deck, depending how the rest of it plays out. Uh, it, right now it's between Artifacts, Bant, and Esper, but that card right there is so good. Let's get moving on here. We have Loyal Unicorn for three and a white. It's a 3-4 Unicorn with Vigilance, has Lieutenant. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you control your commander, prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to creatures you control this turn. Other creatures you control gain vigilance until end of turn. Very good lieutenant creature. Giving other creatures vigilance, basically a dolmen gate kind of effect where your creatures can't take uh, combat damage is utterly insane. I like it. 
Our next card is Magus of the Balance. For one and one white, you get a 2-2 Human Wizard. You can pay four and one white and tap it. You sacrifice Magus of the Balance, and each player chooses a number of lands they control equal to the number of lands controlled by the player who controls the fewest, then sacrifices the rest. Players discard cards and sacrifice creatures the same way. Much like its namesake, Magus of the Balance does a very great job at rebalancing the board. Somebody is in a dominant position with card advantage or card draw that, you know, too many cards in hand. They have too many creatures on the field or way too many lands from everybody else have been ramping super hard. This will bring it all back in balance. This card is great. Our next card, Phyrexian Delver. Three and double black for a zombie. When it enters the battlefield, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. You lose life equal to that card's converted mana cost. Uh, pretty basic effect here. It's a 3-2 for 5. Not great, but it does get you a card, creature card, back from your graveyard to the battlefield. It can be very powerful, and you lose life equal to its CMC. It's, I mean, it's, it's good. Good enough. Our next card is also uh, available to be a commander here. <clears throat> Excuse me, in Esper. Now you'll have to think Yoriko is blue and black, so you would have to uh, make just a blue and black deck with her. She would not be able to run as this Esper commander. Uh, she, she would have to be part of her own deck, and if I built around it, it'd be a ninja deck, honestly. But this one can be the legit uh, Esper commander. It's Yenit Cryptic Sovereign. It's two, uh, two colorless, a white, blue, and a black for a 3-5 Legendary Sphinx. Has Flying, Vigilance, and Menace. Whenever Yenit Cryptic Sovereign attacks, reveal the top card of your library. If that card's converted mana cost is odd, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. Otherwise, draw a card. This card uh, is so great. I mean, the fact that it's a 3-5 with Flying Vigilance is already crazy on the evasion front. And then it gives it Menace on top of that makes it so hard to block. Additionally, its effect triggers on the attack. Declare attackers step. You don't even have to get damage through. Then you get to reveal the top card of your library. Since this is a top card matters deck, you can stack certain things on top. And if that card CMC is odd, which you're going to try and make it odd, you get to play it for free. Even otherwise, if you ha uh, didn't have anything to stack the top of your deck, you're getting a free card draw. I mean, these cards are utterly amazing. Um, versus playing it over Creepy Kid, which is what everybody's calling the commander for the Esper deck. I might. Honestly, yeah, I might. Our next card is Sower of Discord. For four and double black, you get a 6-6 demon with flying. As Sower of Discord enters the battlefield, choose two players. Whenever damage is dealt to one of the chosen players, the other chosen player also loses that much life. We've seen another card in this set similar to that, and it's also similar to Saskia, uh, which was a previous commander from the Brea Atraxa series. It's a pretty good effect. Uh, we're getting a reprint of Terminus, four and double white, sorcery with miracle. Put all creatures on the bottom of their owner's libraries. The miracle cost for this is one white. Uh, not much to say about this other than it's utterly amazing. I would absolutely play this all day, especially with miracle, it's so good. Even at six, putting things on the bottom of their owner's libraries, not destroying them. It's much like an exile effect, yes, they'll be able to come back, but at, you know it clears the board. Uh, without having to do destroy stuff. So there's, you know, some gods in there that come back out of the graveyard, at, you know, at the beginning of the end step or whatever. You don't have to worry about things like that, so it's pretty nice. Next card is Aminatu's Augury. For six and double blue, we have a sorcery. Exile the top eight cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield. Until end of turn, for each non-land card type, you may cast a card of that type from among the exiled cards without paying its mana cost. Oh, this is this is complicated. I'm honestly going to have to reread this. At 8 mana, it's already a very expensive effect, but that seems to be the theme in every deck here. Exile top 8 of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield until end of turn for each non-land card type. Okay, so it's like... Um, <clears throat> I can't remember that thing that checks whatever non-land card types you have in your graveyard. So you could have like a non-land card type would be artifact, creature, enchantment, aura... Etc. So you could possibly, let's see, yeah, you may cast a card of that type from among the exile cards. Yeah, so you could cast basically one of each of those type of cards from your graveyard for each one that you have of that type. So it, it could be really, really good card. Again, another late game, potentially blowout and the game card. It's fine. 
Art on it's pretty cool, though. Creepy kid, man. <laughs> Next card is Knight Incarnate, 4 and a black for a 3-4 Elemental with Death Touch. When Knight Incarnate leaves the battlefield, all creatures get minus 3, minus 3 until end of turn. Has Evoke for 3 and a black. Uh, evoke lets you cast the spell for its Evoke cost instead of its regular mana cost. If you do, it's sacrificed when it enters the battlefield. And that might seem silly, but the effect of that is the Evoke cost is cheaper. And, it, and, you know, maybe you don't have enough mana and you want this to come in and just basically wipe the board for minus three, minus three. That's the effect that you would do that for. So, not not bad. I like it. They're, they're putting a lot of board wipes in here that I'm pretty thrilled about because most pre-con commander decks don't do very well with board wipes. Uh, so this one's looking up. And our next card additionally is going to have Evoke as well. It's Reprint Mold Drifter. Four and a blue for a 2-2 elemental with flying. When Mold Drifter enters the battlefield, you draw two cards, and then it has an evoke cost of two and a blue. Very uh, old-time standard card, draw two for three with the evoke cost, or you can cast it for five if you really want the body. It's just a great card. Um, that's all there is to say about it. Our next card is Primordial Mist. For four and a blue, you get an enchantment that reads, at the beginning of your end step, you may manifest the top card of your library. Manifesting is putting the top card of your library onto the battlefield face down as a 2-2 creature. You turn it face up any time for its mana cost if it's a creature card. And that's an option if you want to do that. Uh, second part of the text here, exile a face down permanent you control face up. You may play that card this turn. You will still pay its costs. Timing rules will still apply. Okay, so at the beginning of your end step, you may manifest the top card of your library. And then you can exile a face-down permanent you control face-up, and you may play that card this turn. It's basically just advantage. I mean, that's why I'm reading it. They, they, they're putting the text on some of these cards so strangely worded. Well, that's how I'm reading it. Five, five card enchantment advantage. Not bad. Uh, next card here is Predict. One blue and one for an instant. Choose a card name. Then target player puts the top card of their library into their graveyard. If that card has the chosen name, you draw two cards. Otherwise, you draw a card. So this is obviously for stacking the top of your deck. You play Predict on yourself. Um, or I suppose you could do it to your opponent if you're Fate Sealing them with that other card. And then you draw two cards. Uh, at worst, you're still going to draw one card, which... Yeah, two mana for one card at instant speed is pretty bad, but it's better than nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our next card here, multicolor, Silent Blade Oni. This is a reprint as well. Three colorless, two blue and two black for a 6-5 Demon Ninja with Ninjutsu for four, a blue and a black. Uh, this is very similar to Commander Ninjutsu. Um, I'll read it though. So for four, a blue and a black, you can return an unblocked attacker you control to hand. Put this card onto the battlefield from your hand, tapped and attacking. Its second text here is, whenever Silent Blade Oni deals combat damage to a player, look at that player's hand, and you may cast a non-land card in it without paying that card's mana cost. Very powerful card, very powerful effect. It is super expensive, though. Um, but Ninjutsu is always something that I've wanted to play around, and I haven't. just seems like such a great effect that your opponent never knows what's going to happen. Oh, I won't block that 1-1. One, one. You flash in Silent Blade Oni, hit them for 6, play a card out of their hand, you know, maybe a stupid big Eldrazi or, you know, some sort of Hydra or something. Seems fun, you know, and funny. So I, I'd like to try that out. And seeing some of, uh, seeing at least the one ninja getting printed, the new one, is really nice. And especially that it can be a commander. So I can actually get geared towards making one of these decks would be awesome. Our next card is Sarah Avatar. Four and triple white for a star star creature avatar. Sarah Avatar's power and toughness are each equal to your life total. And when Sarah Avatar is put into a graveyard from anywhere, shuffle it into its owner's library. Um, basically, the, just another reprint. Not too bad of a card. It does cost 7, but if you're playing Commander, this could technically be a 40-40, and anytime it dies, it'll shuffle back into your library. So it keeps coming back, recurrable. Not bad. Aether Mage's Touch is our next card. It's going to be two colorless, a white, and a blue for an instant. Reveal the top four cards of your library. You may put a creature card from among them onto the battlefield. It gains. At the beginning of your end step, return this creature to its owner's hand. Then put the rest of the cards revealed this way on the bottom of your library in any order. 
So, if you manage to stack the top of your deck well enough, this is basically a 4-drop draw card. Except it has the upside of the card goes on the field if it's a creature. <clears throat> so, not bad. I mean, you get it in, you can swing with it, you bounce it back to your hand. Maybe it has an evoke effect like Muldrifter, so you can play it again and get a 2-card draw off of it. That's a pretty cool little card. I do like that. We're seeing a reprint here with Brainstorm. Um, one of the best or better draw effects uh, in the game, notwithstanding the power 9, of course. Brainstorm is one blue for an instant. You draw three, then put two cards from your hand on top of your library in any order. Now, that might sound a little weird, uh, but the reason it's good is because it costs one. At instant speed, you draw three cards first, then you put two cards from your hand on top of your library in any order. This is any two cards. It doesn't have to be two of the three that you drew. So if you're holding on to seven, You'll play this, you'll go down to six, you'll draw three, bring you up to nine. And then out of the entire nine card spread, you can pick two of the worst cards that you don't need. And you just drew three new cards, which is great, and just slap them back on top. And then potentially if you have another card like a Evolving Wilds or a Ponder or a Fetchland, you can shuffle those two terrible cards away at that point. That's why this card is so very powerful. Um, additionally, because you can do it on instant speed, you could do it at somebody's end step. And you could put something that's a little good on top of your deck that you maybe don't want to get rid of. And you can end up drawing that. And then hitting your fetch land on your uh, on your first main. So that's a really great uh, card. Our next card here is Crystal Ball. Three colorless for an artifact. You have pay one, tap, and scry two. Super basic effect. Um, I'm not sure I would ever play that, but in a top card matters deck, there you go. Banishing Stroke as our next card. We have five and a white for an instant with Miracle. You put target artifact creature or enchantment on the bottom of its owner's library, and its Miracle cost can be one. So this is basically Terminus, but <laughs> for for a single target, and it can work on an artifact creature or enchantment. Um, not bad. Not bad. I don't know if I'd play it, honestly. It's very specific, and for six, like, if you didn't get it off its Miracle cost, bleh. It's terrible. I probably wouldn't play that, but I'd certainly play Terminus. Oh, let's see. Getting around to our next card, we have Cloud Form. I haven't seen this in a while. One and double blue for an enchantment. When Cloud Form enters the battlefield, it becomes an aura with enchant creature. Manifest the top card of your library and attach Cloud Form to it. The enchanted creature has flying and hexproof. This can be a very powerful combo. Uh, I have seen people use it to good effect, and I like it a lot. So, it's cool to see it here. We're going to get into a couple lands here, which I'm pretty excited about. We have Mountain Valley, which uh, enters Battlefield tapped. You can tap it, sacrifice Mountain Valley, search your library for a mountain or forest card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. We also have Rocky Tar Pit, which enters the Battlefield tapped as well. You can tap it to sacrifice Rocky Tar Pit, search your library for a swamp or mountain card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. These are not as good as your uh, fetch lands, your typical fetch lands, but these are indeed fetch lands, and that's awesome. The upside is you don't have to pay the life that you would normally pay with your typical fetch land. The downside is they come in tapped, but they will fetch you any swamp or mountain or any mountain or forest, so you can fetch any of your uh, dual lands, you know, your pain lands, your shock lands, or whatever else. Uh, I don't know if the commander lands have the multi-type. I think the I think some of the cyclers do. I don't know. Anyways, it's great to see you know something reprinted that you know fetch lands are so expensive. Some of them range from twenty to eighty dollars depending on which one you're going to buy. So it's nice to see little budget options like this that somebody like myself could afford. Um, I'm desperately in need of in fetch lands for my five color slivers deck. I only have a few, and I only have a few of the shocks, so this would go a long way to helping me out, actually, so I'm very happy to see that. And then, of course, we have a reprint here of Commander's Sphere, which is a three-drop artifact. You can tap it to add one mana of any color to, uh, in your commander's color identity. And then you can also sacrifice it to draw a card. We have a reprint on Swiftfoot Boots for two colorless. You get an artifact equipment. The equipped creature has Hexproof and Haste, and you can equip the creature for one colorless. And, of course, the old standby, Soul Ring, one colorless for an artifact that taps and adds two waste to your mana pool. We're also going to see a reprint of Command Tower. We all knew we would. It's a land. It taps. It adds one mana of any color in your commander's color identity. 
And I guess it's interesting to see our next card here, which is Myriad Landscape. It's a land and it enters the battlefield tapped. You can tap it to add waste to your mana pool. You can also pay two and tap it, sacrifice it, and search your library for up to two basic land cards that share a land type, put them onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. It's interesting to see that card coming back. I wonder if that's going to be in the Esper deck or if that's going to be in every deck. Um, I could see it... Hmm. I guess I could see it in every deck. It'd be kind of weird uh, for like a three color, though. That's, that is kind of strange to see that. We'll see what deck that ends up in. Our final card that we have here for our spoiler is Boreas Charger. It's a 2 and 1 white for a 2-1 Pegasus with flying. When Boreas Charger leaves the battlefield, choose an opponent who controls more lands than you. Search your library for a number of plain cards equal to the difference and reveal them. Put one of them onto the battlefield tapped and the rest into your hand, then shuffle your library. Um, white doing, I won't say doing what it does best, but there are many effects in white that make it when your opponent has more lands than you, you're like, oh, nah, -uh, I'm catching up. And then you pick that guy that has the lower amount of lands and you fetch a couple of lands out. You know, be it land tax, be it this card. I know there's, I think, I believe it's Knight of the White Orchid. There's multiple effects that do that for you, and that's great, because white honestly needs it. They don't really have any ramp um, other than, you know, colorless artifacts, stuff like that. So it's nice to see more effects like that. So that's going to wrap up day four for our spoilers, guys. Let me know what you thought uh, in the comments down below, if anything sticks out to you. I'm super excited for Yoriko, the Tiger's Shadow. Um, Yennet, Cryptic Sovereign, is also super amazing. Uh, I'm getting pretty hyped about these fetch lands as well. And I'm definitely looking forward to making a, a ninja commander deck, or at least trying. Maybe it'll be a ninja samurai crossover thing, because I know a lot of samurais and a lot of ninjas don't exist in the game. So I'm not sure exactly how well that would work. I'd probably have to run it with something else. But anyways, guys, I appreciate you guys keeping up with the spoilers with me. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time right here on Everything MTG. Peace.